Okay, then we'll move on to the last speaker of the day. Simon? Okay. okay, floor is yours. Good. Good evening. I'm going to try and keep you all awake and start off with a small quiz. It's July 2007. How many contributors to the OpenStreetMap data were they at this point in time? I should point out I see a couple of people there that are excluded from answering this question. Nobody knows? Oh, you're awfully off, Dermot. Okay, you're going in the wrong direction. There were 1,125 contributors to the OSM data. It's a bit of a fuzzy number because at that time there were still anonymous contributions. What happened then? July 2007? Nobody knows? Hmm? No. Sotom, Manchester, and what happened there? There was a panel, and at a panel, people decided that the current license sucked and that we should change. At the time, the OSM data was licensed CC by SA 2.0, so a share-like license, Creative Commons, uh, designed for creative works, which are normally the subject of copyright. And it just didn't really work for data. And uh, even Creative Commons was saying that at that point in time. So it was decided to undertake an effort to change the license, which brings us to December 2009. How many contributors to the OSM data set did we have at that point in time? Anybody know? Nope. No. No. Okay. There were 93,403. And why did it take two years, well, yeah, two years, massive growth, essentially 99%. Um, and what happened then? This is probably too difficult, but there was a vote to change the ODBL by the OSMF members. I think 400 or so, two, 300 voted. Now, you're probably going to ask, why did this take so long? Well, it's very easy. In July 2007, there was no license to change to. So these two years were used up developing the ODBL. Now, um, to illustrate some of the sentiments at the time, an excerpt from the email on the legal talk list. Ah, certain interpretation of being rushed, I have to say. Okay, again, a year later, we have 118,000 OSM contributors. And this is an important number for the rest of the talk. What happened then? we actually introduced the new contributor terms for the sign-up, where they already agreed that they would support the ODPL if we switched to it. This is more important than most people think, because this was actually the point of no return. Because from then on, we had a contract with every new sign-up 
that was different from what we had with the other 118,000 contributors. So it's June 2011, and again something happened. We stopped the decliners from contributing. They could still log in and so on, but they couldn't actually edit the map. And I should point out that there are many people in the audience here which know a lot more about this than I do, because this is about roughly when I became involved. It's July 2012. Everybody should remember that that was around there. What happened then? We started redacting the data. And shortly afterwards, in Tokyo, we switched to the ODBL. And you can see it took a long time, five years. And the question was naturally during the whole period, you know, what, how hard is that going to hurt us? If you remember the number back then when we actually put the new contributor terms into force, were 118,000 contributors. Of those 118,000, interesting enough, 20,000 didn't actually have any not deleted data in the database. And all our counts that we did never considered them. So there were about 27,000 people that had actually contributed to the data. And of those, when we switched the license, 75,000 had agreed. The small number of 279 had disagreed. And we had nearly 40,000 which hadn't responded. And we redacted data from a rough, or redacted, essentially removed the data or removed the edits from roughly 50,000 people. 50,000 difference to the the numbers there is being the people that didn't actually have any undeleted data. Now people can remember that I ran scripts giving all these numbers and I actually reran them last month or beginning of this month and currently we have 62,353 which agreed. So actually 5,000 people came back post license change and agreed to the contributor terms. That's quite a significant number because we only had 90,000 or so which had data, so it's a 5% effect. And even some of the people that disagreed changed their mind. And luckily that didn't really help because we had already deleted the data. Now just to give you an idea of what the effect roughly was when we deleted the data. So roughly about 1% plus minus went away. Um, this is a bit pessimistic numbers because the projected numbers and not what we actually deleted, but it was not more than this. Now, one of the things that uh, people said, you know, yeah, it's too early. In, in, in September, in July 2012, I said, oh, you're rushing us. You should wait and carry and, you know, spend another year tracking down people. Well, you know, if you look at these numbers, and this is what if, so it's using the, the full history dump from July 2012, running the same scripts, but with the current... Um, number of people that had agreed, you will notice that the difference is very, very small. So in the end, I think we more or less hit the optimum point in time to change the license. Now, the thing which I haven't listen, listed and which you can't express in numbers is really the other part of the story, namely that between 2007 and 2012, the main topic in OpenStreetMap was the license change. And the concentration was completely on that and lots of things didn't get done. 
at a time when the community went up from just over a thousand people up to 280,000. And I think that was the largest part of the damage. Now, naturally, since 2012, we've had constant moaning that we should change the license. But everybody who was involved in the process would think, well, you know, I'd rather cut off a piece of my body instead of doing that, at least right now. So, that brings me to my talk. As you probably know, I'm a uh, long time been involved on the administrative side of OpenStreetMap. Um, I've been on the board and currently I'm the chair of the license working group. And what follows is more or less my brain dump about, you know, what are the issues right now, um, perhaps even saying that there are no issues right now, and uh, what our daily business is. One of the questions in preparing this, uh, this talk was, well, you know, we always say we need a license and uh, we don't really clearly say what we want from that license. Well, one thing is clear, our contributor terms that are essentially immutable, so that the license has to be free and open. So, essentially means doesn't discriminate against any kind of use. And a uh, hot topic, at least for historical reasons, we started off with a share-alike license and we've continued that on. And there's no indication right now that a larger part of the community would want to change. I'm not saying that change is impossible or so on, but it's, there's not been a groundswell of support for changing to something else. Now, what does the, the, the incorporation documents for the OpenStreetMap Foundation say? Well, they say we should be encouraging the growth, development, and distribution of free geospatial data and providing geospatial data for anybody to use and share. Now, at least for me, and I fully admit that this is completely subjective, that implies a couple of things. The license should be simple to apply. We have a unified data set. One of, the, one of the small number of things that I agree with with Mike Mikorski is actually that the unified data set is one of the biggest assets of OpenStreetMap. So we should have unified terms of use for our data to make it simple. And the other thing for making it easy to use our data for any consumers is that there should be a single license source or a single person who licenses the data and a single point of contact. Now, the license working group, and I have to admit that most of this work was done with little involvement on my behalf, has issued a number of guidelines which have gone through a community process of comments, not necessarily community approval, but which have in the end been agreed to by the board of the OSMF. There's a guideline on what substantial is, there's a guideline on what a produced work is, there's a guideline on trivial transformations and so on. And all these are essentially there to clarify gray areas in the license. And don't believe that the ODBL is particularly complicated because we need all these guidelines. It's actually relatively simple. But the problem is naturally that we have geospatial data and geospatial data is different than say if we be, if we're applying it to Wikipedia data. So there are always clarifications needed when you're applying a license to a specific subject. Now what we're working on right now is a review of the import licenses. This is mainly 
been triggered by questions with respect to the Creative Commons by 4.0 license, which unluckily a lot of governments are switching to for their open data license. Um, but in general, actually, other import licenses belong um, into this review as well. That impacts the licensor status of the OSMF. Are we really the licensor of the data if we import something which is licensed CC by 4.0? And it impacts the unified license terms. You can think of OSM a bit like a meat mincer. I mean, there are a lot of nasty thing, things people say about sausages, but essentially, the sausage that you get out and you go and buy at the butcher, you wouldn't want to have different terms of use for small parts of the sausage. <laughs> and you, didn't want, you probably wouldn't want to have multiple points of contact if the sausage wasn't good. And you would go back to your butcher and the butcher would say, well, you know, but that data is from somebody else, and I'm not the licensor. So that's actually an important point for making things easy to use. What we're specifically not working on right now is a geocoding guideline. I'll come back to that. ODBL 1.1, not working on that either. And we're definitely not working on a license change. Um, just to clarify, if at one point in time somebody, we come to the conclusion that we should change the license, the OSMF board would actually have to give us a mandate to do so and work on it. And that hasn't happened. So we're not going to start working on that on our own accord. But when I had wrote, read all this down, I came to the conclusion, well, you know, that's our shopping list. And we are people which have been working with OSM for a long time. Some of us as legal, are legal professionals and so on, and they all have different questions. So what I did was look at our legal questions mailbox, which we've had active since uh, January 2015. And I sifted through 321 mails and tried to categorize them. And the categorization is relatively rough, and I only took the main subject. So in principle, you could have counted, double counted stuff, but I didn't do that. And uh, it's quite interesting. We had a fair large number, and continue to have a fair large number, of requests for media releases. So this is like Fox, Fox system. Fox is one of those which have come in asking, well, we're, you know, we're producing this film and we need you to fill out this five page media release so that we can conclude your map in our production. Now you read through that five page media release and you say, no way, because there's lots of stuff which we can't do. Uh, like warrant that all the data is ours and so on. So, um, the next one is commercial use. A lot of people seem to be of the opinion, yeah, well, they need special permission if they're using it in an app or uh, uh, perhaps my app will have to be licensed on ODBL terms and so on. Um, that's a fairly common question. And the next one is the one you would expect. I'm using OSM data together with third-party data, do I have, is, does share like apply or doesn't it? And um, those are the most difficult ones and the rest are essentially attribution questions. Where do I and how do I attribute? Then we have the couple of interesting ones like where do I, how much do services from the OSMF cost? Which I always answer with um, a long list of stuff that says, well, it's actually free, but you can go to a commercial service provider. So we're running out of time here. Already uh, touched on that, 321 total, 207 license or terms of service related. 
does not include two dozen or so that went to the legal working group directly. And yes, nobody inquired about bulk geocoding. Some of them might have, should have done that, but they didn't. And to finish off experience, our current material and guidelines actually cover most of the use cases. For a lot of people, the license terms seem to be more relaxed than they would actually experience. There are all these people that are asking about commercial use. There's currently no good way to deal with releases for film, TV and video. And the current tile license, which most of these media releases refer to, um, actually doesn't work at all. And it doesn't make sense. It's a historic letter over, left over. And if we should change something, then we should probably change that. And only a very small number of the proposed data users wouldn't actually be possible under our current license regime. So, nearly on time. <laughs> questions? Any questions for the speaker? Thanks for the talk. Um, quick question. You mentioned that the uh, geocoding guideline is not in work. Can you expand a little bit on this? Um, I'm just saying that it currently isn't in work. Um, from a logical point of view, we wanted to get that collective database guideline out of the way because that is actually the foundation for any work that we do with, which has to do with using third-party data with OpenStreetMap data. And from a logical point of view, that should come first. It is not particularly high on our to-do list simply because, as I said, it's not something that people out outside of the service provider ecosystem around OpenStreetMap ask for. So I'm not saying it's unimportant, it's just saying, you know, there's other stuff which we might be looking at. And the li license working group, sometimes we call ourselves the legal working group, uh, does do other stuff as well. So we have other documents in the work which are currently a bit more important. Sorry, can I question one of the assumptions? I'm, I'm fairly new to the community, so um, when Wikidata was first happening, the uh, decision was made to go CC0 for a very simple reason that, well, two reasons. One, it's very easy to consume. It's hard to get the data into Wikidata, but it's very, very easy to consume for any kind of use cases. And second, data is fairly hard to license by definition of the data because like, the height of Everest is not licensable. You can try collection license. So has there been much talk in terms of like switching away from the SA part to CC0? Um, historically, you have to understand, and this was before my time, um, is that CC by SA was chosen essentially as an anti-Google license. And by the way, we know that the same sentiments are in the Wikimedia Foundation in some places as well. Um, and it was discussed at the time very intensively. And that was the big argument besides a couple of landsmen of mine which wanted to stick with CC by SA. Um, but everybody else, essentially the discussion was ODBL or PD or CC0. And uh, right now, there's, as I said, there's no real motivation to change. Um, if there was a groundswell of support for moving away, um, obviously we would discuss it. And naturally, there's lots of problems. And the ODBL is a fairly complicated license, not on absolute scales, but relative to some of the simpler things, um, uh, because of data being complicated to license. 
I'm on the data working group, so I can speak specifically to the idea of going to CC0, and it would involve removing basically all imported data outside the US, uh, probably hit around 40% of, the, say, 20 to 40% of the data in OpenStreetMap, depending on how you measure it, um, completely ob obliterate uh, all addresses, all buildings in some areas. Um, basically, go, switching to CC0 will not happen because it will exclude using most government open data and it may, aside from that, it may conflict with the contributor term attribu attribution requirements. Yeah, I, I mean, Paul just made it clear. Nobody would actually consider going to CC0. The, the effect of that would be disastrous. But you, you could discuss going to a, a attribution-based license of some kind. Um, but there's a lot of difficult details there. I'm just like curious, like since OSM is hosted in the UK, if the Brexit thing ever like happens, then like do we still have like um, database rights, or I mean, like have you thought about like I don't know, like what the impact is for OSM? Well, the the serious answer is nobody knows. The not so serious answer is that we keep on making jokes about Brexit. And I just had with, with Louis, former uh, legal person with Wikimedia, um, we're joking about, you know, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, we, it's just, we, we have um, one of the ongoing documents that we're working on, and actually, which has just been approved by the OSMF board, is a new version of the privacy policy, which again, it's potentially impacted by Brexit in one to two years, so nobody knows. But the license itself is designed to work without actually database rights existing in every country. So, in principle, it should, there should be no serious problem there. Uh, what, are the, what are the means of the foundation to check uh, whether people break the license? I mean, if we suspect some company is uh, using OpenStreetMap data and they don't share it alike with the, their own data, do you have a means to, to go and investigate what's going on and to prove it? Just want. I actually ha always have extra slides, uh, but unluckily my computer is not responding, so I can't show you to them. Um, we got we, we get regularly we get enforcement requests. Um, typically, we try to push them back down to the local communities, because these are typically local operators, and only if that doesn't work, we will um, try and engage, because. Anything else just wouldn't scale. So it's really important that we, we only try and implement processes which actually scale a bit. And, um, you yeah, know, and, and one of the things is proving things. I mean, I've made a fool of myself often enough going to Google and saying, well, we've heard that somebody has copied um, OpenStreetMap data into Google. And most of the time, you know, it could be that the people are inspired or it could be real copying, but it's extremely difficult to, to prove. There are other things, non-attribution, um, using the whole data set in some way, which is naturally far easier to show. And, and uh, most of the time it's just, you know, not people being nasty, just people saying, oh, we didn't realize that we had to do that. One last question. Oh, 
Yeah, uh, so initially you shared some numbers on how uh, the change in license increased the number of contributors. Oh, so what is the right way? Because uh, my question was, how did the change in license sort of have an impact on the increase? The, the, the increase in users was completely uh, independent of the change in license. If uh, particularly the 2007 to 2009 increase has mainly to do with Richard Fairhurst, who wrote to Potlatch One at that time, and um, who's not here because the meeting was too hot. Um, <laughs> but um, what, what the, the impact is really, um, was um, the, the big problem was really that we didn't actually take the community which grew so much in that time through the whole process why we were actually changing the license. So it was a very small group, small panel in, in 2007 which essentially made the decision and when the things happened, we had nearly 300,000 users. And uh, that's problematic and should be kept at the back of our heads for any future change that we need to manage that a bit better and faster, if possible. So I think we're finished, huh? OK. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask Simon later. Let's thank our speaker again for tackling this rather heavy uh, subject so late on a Friday evening. Uh, that concludes